I think I found a new way to end prayers. <laughs> you know, maybe right after the Lord's Prayer today, if you're feeling bold. A little, little joyful laugh at the end. Seems kind of a fun way to do it. Or singing. But we're not going to sing the Lord's Prayer today. That would be too confusing. Okay, um, Mike, I realize you've already done camera thing. I want to go from here to here. So, no, from, from this mic to this mic. So I'm not getting doubled. We are learning new things today. We're figuring out how to use the wireless microphone and, 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 and learning about bread with fruit and stuff in it and all sorts of good things. Um, today we're going to look at 1 Samuel in the 17th chapter, verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to skip over and pick up again at 31. And it will make sense why I'm skipping. One is if I read you 51 verses, you'll all be asleep before your normal allotted time. And the other is um, the story kind of, well, it lags a little in the middle. So here's where it starts. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Sokoth, which mean belonged to, Ju to Judah, and encamped between Sokoth and Azekah in Ephems Gamin. You know, why don't I have the lay people read these scriptures? <laughs> Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of God, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. All that, and he needed a shield bearer. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I fail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This is where we jump to verse 31. Let me tell you what happens in the meantime. A whole lot of Israelites go, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. There, you're caught up. When the words that David spoke were heard, they were, oh, and David said, I, I could. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a boy, and he's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turns it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and placed them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. 
The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, of God, of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew it out of his sheath, and killed him. And then he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Here ends the reading of the word. May God bless to our understanding this reading of the scriptures. Will you pray with me? God of mercy and grace, we come to you on this day seeking your guidance, your help, and your hope. As we have read from your word, now help us as we seek to interpret it. Be with us and guide us, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now the internet viewers are going to have a problem for the first time because I just walked out of the frame. There is a disembodied voice on the internet that Mike is going to correct. And he said, oh, actually, it's really wide frame, didn't it? So they're fine. Never mind. I forgot, he leaves it really wide. I decided to come down here because you were all at least two rows back, and I figured why not come to you if you're not going to come to me. Um, plus, I actually prefer reading out from the pulpit where I can see who's sleeping. <laughs> it's the really big, uh, I got my eye on you, mister. It's the really big issue. So, today's text, this story of David and Goliath, was one of the ones that was in the list. You remember the list, right? When I asked a few months ago for topics people wanted to hear a sermon on because in part of July and August I was going to break from the lectionary and just preach on what things folks were interested in and try to use the hymns that folks liked. Yes. Um, so we're not going to get a study and die out of that because I like the notion and discipline of also being forced to preach texts I otherwise wouldn't want to, which is what the lectionary does. But today, we're going to take on David and Goliath. And this is one of those stories we all know kind of, right? You knew what the end was going to be because you knew the story. You knew that David would prevail in this battle. You knew that Goliath, that cute little brown dog from the Sunday morning cartoon. Anybody else grow up watching the Children's Hour? I, I wouldn't go to church till baby and Goliath was over. No, 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 no. The Philistine is not the cute little brown claymation dog. That is a different one, but it was always one of my favorites as a child. That should have been a sign to me of what was coming in life that I would refuse to go to Sunday school until I finished David and Goliath. But regardless, David is faced with it. Well, really, all of Israel is faced with the challenge. And I think to put it in perspective, the nation was in a major turmoil here. Saul was really struggling with the Israelites even accepting his leadership as king at this moment. 
The, the monarchy was in trouble, so to speak. And as this weakened Israel shows up, they encounter the Philistines who say, hey, weak monarch, opportunity, let's take over some land. And so here comes this battle. And Goliath, larger than life, shows up as the champion of the Philistines. When I first started preaching, the champion was a hard concept to get through the folks. But then, thankfully, Harry Potter came along and introduced champions and representatives of schools. If you've read those books, of course, this group's not nodding knowingly, so uh, maybe just catch the movie. It's easier. Um, and, uh, and suddenly people understood again, oh, okay, just representative, the whole army sits there and watches while this one happens. And I catch myself every time I read this text thinking about what would happen in our world if we settled wars by champions instead of by full armies. Actually, I kind of rather see it being video gaming at this point because I think we've got an edge. Um, at least based on my kids alone. You know, we, we, but regardless, that's an aside. And David gets armed for the battle, right? David is appropriately armed for the battle. They put the helmet on his head and the mail on his body. They <coughs> hand him a sword, and he takes all that stuff, and you can just see him go. I can't do this. <laughs> this ain't going to work. But did you catch the part of the story. Oh, that's right. You didn't because I glossed over it. It was in verses 11 to 31. There's an important part of the story, and I thought about reading that one little extra verse and decided that would just create more confusion. I'll just tell you about it when the time comes. When David responds to the call, who knows the story well enough? What's he do first? Good. He perceives the voice of God calling him forth. And that's an interesting phrase. He doesn't hear it booming from the sky. God doesn't show up in a burning bush to David. God doesn't send down a memo. God doesn't flash an email out. Wait, that wouldn't have happened anyway. God simply puts on David's heart, the knowledge that God will be with him in the battle and that he is being called to volunteer. It's a defining moment for David. It's what arguably makes him seen as worthy of being the eventual king that will follow Saul's path. And David enters the battle not just with five small, smooth stones chosen from the Wadi River. Not just with a slingshot. We get caught in that element. But the reality is, David enters the battle with something much bigger. And you did hear clues about that when we read the text, right? What were the clues? David says, you know, a smart preacher would have had this open and ready to go. That's exactly what David said. David says to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Did you hear it that time, church? David came knowing that God was with him. God would guide him. God would help him. That confidence, that knowledge that God will be with us. I like the plain green screen. Makes me pretend I'm a little man. <laughs> that got you. God will 
for them. We spend a lot of time as modern Christians worrying about the state of the world, worrying about the state of the church, worrying about how things will end up, worrying about what's going to happen next. But you know, I'm willing to venture that if I pulled each one of you very privately, each one on your own so you didn't have the pressure of public opinion, I'm willing to wager that the vast majority, if not every one of you, would say, I believe God will prevail. And yet we worry. And yet we see things that we think are bigger than ourselves. We imagine things that are bigger than God. When all God needs is not even five small smooth stones. How many actually got used? One. And God didn't even really need that one. Right? <laughs> you know, I, I have often read this story and thought to myself, what would happen... If Goliath just goes out to the field, talks his smack talk, David throws the smack talk back at him, right? Because that's what that is. That's biblical smack talk that they do about I'll cut off your heads and feed your bodies to the birds in the air and I'll do that to you. And then Goliath just falls over with a heart attack. Boom. Done. Gone. You know, in the realm of God's possibility, absolutely. As fun a story, not so much. You know, we like cheering for David. We like that defining moment. And that defining moment was important in God's overall vision for what he, God had in mind for David in terms of the great era of Israel's life and history. That's all great, and I'm glad I got my biblical history lesson today, Rick. But here's the thing. I come here to get applications for life. Am I right? Good. Those five small, smooth stones. Those five tools of preparation that David has used. I want to draw a parallel for you today that says, if you want to encounter life confident that God will prevail, that God will be with you, that God will help you through those challenges, there are five small stones available to you. Those smooth stones are what we often call our spiritual disciplines, right? Read the scriptures. And I want to say to you today, church, don't get intimidated. I make the mistake of saying to you too often, study the Bible. And everybody goes, I don't have the tools to study the Bible. I don't know. Where would I begin? What would I do? And I had a counselor working with me once, a spiritual advisor, who said, Something brilliant that has always rattled in my head and it's just now making it all the way to application because that's how those things go. God said to me, he handed me a book. It was not the Bible. He said, I said, what do you want me to do with this? Do you want me to read a certain section? Do you want me to you know, give me an assignment? He said, just let it work on you like scripture. When it comes to studying the Bible and letting yourself get intimidated because you don't know what curriculum, you don't know where to begin, you don't know what story, you need a guide, you don't know the history and this and that, take my friend Don's advice. Just pick a part. Old Testament is full of great stories. Read the story, but then let it work on you. Rick's quick formula for Bible study is this. Read the Word. What does it say? Ask yourself what it means. Ask yourself what it means to me. And then ask yourself if there's anything you need to do about it. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? What am I going to do about it? Four easy steps. You don't have to have all these guidebooks and study guides and everything else to help you through. Let the Word just work on you. Sometimes, especially that what am I going to do about it? Nothing. Sometimes it's a story like David and Goliath, where it's like, you know what? This story is there to help me remember and be encouraged that God will prevail. Good. And therefore, all I need to do about it is believe that. Trust that. Ask for that. Oh, ask for that. That's one of the second, that's the second stone, right? 
Spend time in prayer. Not just talking to God, but listening for God. Third stone. Gather with other Christians. Be available to one another. Encourage one another. We call it worship. Praise God together. Get yourself refilled. I think I heard that earlier in the service. Thank you, Kathy, for helping me with an illustration, even though you didn't know it. Um, get yourself refilled. And the last two are the hard ones. Well, they're not if you let joy take over your life. Because the last two, in essence, are become more generous. Give your time. Give your money. Make a difference in lives. Become, seek to become as generous as <coughs> you can. Later this afternoon, I'm going to be meeting with a church online in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And they've asked me to spend 40 minutes talking to them about tithing. Don't you want to Skype in on that? You want to join? Everybody wants to do that, right? No? We're not going to talk about tithing much. We're going to talk about it for maybe three minutes. And then we're going to talk about striving to live generously instead. Because I am of the belief that tithing is great. I do it. I believe in the discipline of doing so. But I also know that that's not enough. My heart does not sing until I feel I have sought to be generous. Living generously means giving of yourself, serving others, as well as giving of your resources. So those two stones, serving others and giving of your resources, make up five, right? Um, reading the scriptures, communing with God in prayer, gathering with other Christians in worship, becoming generous financially, and becoming generous with your time, serving others. Five stones that will give you confidence that God will prevail. Hardest thing in the world is when a challenging time comes to be willing to say, you know what? A, I trust God to handle this. Right? We're very independent people. We don't like to trust God to handle this. But B, looking for ways to give yourself away in the midst of those. David did not have any expectation of being the one that stepped up. There were plenty of other Israelites that looked the part and said no. 20 verses of it, more or less. <laughs> David stepped up because God put on his heart. This is something I'm calling you to do. You may not be asked to take on or battle a giant. Odds are good you won't be. Unless that giant is hunger or homelessness or helplessness or hopelessness or, or, or need or loneliness. And those are pretty giant things. So pick up your five smooth stones. Be willing to give up yourself. And listen for that voice of God telling you all in you. I hope you respond.